So we're going to have a more formal lecture today that I want to hope uh, updates everything and gets where we are from a year ago to today. And I'm going to do it in one go. It's going to be long. I'll keep my eye on the chat. And if I see a question that seems, if I catch it out of the corner of my eye, I'm going to be focusing on the screen. If I catch something out of the corner of my eye, um, I will try and address it. If I don't address it uh, whilst I'm talking during the presentation, please, I'll answer questions at the end. Okay, and strap yourselves in. It's going to take a while to get through this, okay, because what I want to do is for any new listeners that might be coming from different domains that they need to understand every step to where I'm going. And as I've said uh, in the title, that the uh, and I've missed this. Okay, it's this this paper that's been on a preprint server has been out a year. It hasn't been published. That's my excuse for not seeing it. Uh, I want to thank. Just check uh second. Uh, Let's just say I, I want to thank Walter for this. I hope um I hope Walter's listening. And uh Walter was the person who alerted me to this. Uh he's sent me some very interesting um studies, as it were, and uh, yeah, so this is from him, and it sort of changed what I was going to be doing today. I wanted to focus on Angela Rasmussen, the militant of the virus world, but um, things this thing is more uh, more important, I'm afraid. And like I say, uh, <laughs> I don't want to panic people. The whole the whole point of knowledge is to make sure that you're you understand what's going on and with knowledge comes clarity with clarity comes uh forethought and with forethought comes the ability to take the appropriate action uh ellie jelly says she's a terrible person oh god she's a slime ball she's the worst that's uh takes up uh, uh, the worst example of what i call the, the uh, the critical theorists taken over the uh, the domain of the STEM fields. She is the tip of the spear, it would, it would seem, with the... Right. You saw the guy who got quotes for Jacob allegedly from COVID. hope that this is something you talk about all the time. Uh, well, potentially, I do talk about it. Okay, so but what we have here is we have a new mechanism to take into account. And um, I'm not surprised that we're starting to see people with variations of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease and hopefully if you follow this presentation it will make sense to you what we're seeing okay and what I hope to do is to be able to give you experimental examples of what that sh may look like and how it's how it could potentially arise uh, particularly now people have had uh, infections for uh, chronic infections for a year uh, critical theory is one of the worst things to happen to the educational system. Indeed, Dr. Algon, Algol, sorry, right on time. Um, so I'm going to begin. There's 38 people here. So this is me, uh, Kevin McCann, uh, 20 years, plus 20 years now, um, working in basal ganglia systems neuroscience. I'm considered an expert on brain uh, interventions, neurological interventions based around deep brain stimulation. I developed the first uh, primate model of uh, Tourette syndrome, vocal tics, etc., etc. You can go to ResearchGate. All my work is there for free. You can contact me anytime at that email. You can go to my website, mccandojo.com, or come to our Discord. The invite should be down below. Uh, let's see. So I think that's all about me. Um, if you follow me, what you should know is that um, when you're going to be talking about viruses, this is how I got into the game, it's important that you have a hard cock and that means understanding the physiological and anatomical and causal aspects of the disease as it relates to Cox postulates and this is the only joke I'm going to do in this stream so um, I haven't updated your pick in 20 years <laughs> true true all right so let's let's do the uh, the 
the basics first. So um, a year ago, this was in January, we had reports of a novel coronavirus uh, in patients in Wuhan, and it was characterized by glass opacities in the lung and seemed to correlate with a uh, severe acute respiratory disorder as uh, the original SARS-CoV. And um, this group, this is New England Journal of Medicine, uh, what they did is they did they took samples from these patients. They were able to show cytopathic effects. Again, this is the title you need, the brief report. If you if you need these papers, you can contact me. They're on our Discord. Everything is on our Discord. Okay, and if it doesn't make sense to you, please feel free to contact me. Okay, so uh, what they showed was uh, that they were able to isolate what looked like. Can I get a laser pointer here? Is this going to work for me? Yeah, laser pointer, bitch. Yeah. So, uh, what they saw, what appeared to be coronaviruses. This is the classic shape that everyone should be becoming familiar with. Uh, morphology often defines function in biology, and here we're seeing a classic example of a coronavirus. These are well-known virology, uh, viral, um subspecies. I guess. I guess you would call them that. That that um. Are well known to science the the morphological characteristics the the these new infections are something else, and we're going to get into what it what they do and why we need to take extra precautions and you shouldn't be listening to people like Ivor Cummings, Andrew Kaufman, last American vagabond, or anyone that's told you that um you can just ignore this thing carry on, rip everything open and let it just rip through your population right now is does doesn't fully understand the facts that with or, or the nature of what we're dealing with. It's very likely that SARS-CoV-2 came out of a lab. Um, oh, so uh, yeah, just to uh, tell you how good we're getting at sort of uh, capturing these agents. What you can see here, these are elect electron microscopy. These are Vero cells that have been transfected with SARS-CoV-2. We know that the, it's SARS-CoV-2 through uh, genetic um, analysis. We can differentiate its genome from uh, Vero cells. And uh, what you can see, all these little buds, that's the coronavirus uh, coming out. And the coronavirus, this coronavirus seems to do something that's quite, I'm as I understand it, unusual uh, in the uh, in the world of viruses, which is make these uh, philopodia, these br these branches that stick out, and these philopodia will puncture neighboring cells. And um, one virus that does this very famously is uh, smallpox. And what I'm going to do in this first half is try to introduce the premise to you that SARS-CoV-2 has come out of a laboratory. Once we've established that it's come out of a laboratory, and we can then orientate ourselves to understand the neurophysiology and how it might affect uh, behavior. So um, here you can see the virus is going along. Uh, I use the metaphor of anyone who's seen uh, John Carpenter's 1981, I think, the thing where the dog uh, at the beginning m morphs and, and attacks the other dogs. Uh, it's the literal equivalent to that for me. That's what you're looking at on the screen right now. So 56 people watching here, that's good to see. Uh, apologies if you've missed the beginning. Uh, you can always go back. This will be a long lecture if you've just joined us, so make yourself comfortable. Okay, get get yourself a drink, get something to eat. I will answer questions. Okay, so so uh, in order to establish Cox postulates, the way we do it today is we do it via animal models. We isolate the pathogen. We then transfer it to a animal model. We see if we get the same disease in the animal model. And then we see if we can identify the virus in animal tissue. That establishes Cox postulates. It's a generally small thing. It's routine now. Anyone who says that we can't do it is blowing smoke up your ass and basically trying to pick your back pocket. Let's move on. So, uh, yes, yeah, so 
This is science paper that came out relatively early, comparative pathogenesis of COVID-19, MERS and SARS in a non-human primate model. So we could, SARS is an established disease, so is Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome and uh, COVID-19, which should be called uh, Wuhan flu or China flu. Somehow we had to make it different uh, because the Chinese were upset. We're not allowed to call uh, diseases from uh, you know, we break the tradition. So we've had Hong Kong flu. Um, but if it's from China, uh, no, we have to call it something else, apparently, according to the World Health Organization. But it's established in non-human primate here. The red pointer doesn't work very well. But here you can see uh, lesions in the lung tissue. This is perfused lung tissue and then fixed for staining. These dark patches of where they've used antibody to uh, identify uh, areas of tissue that are expressing uh, viral um, particles. Um, another, uh, I'm not sure if this one's been published yet, but it might still be on preprint, but uh, basically showing that the, there's species selectivity with the virus. Uh, it's more, uh, it, it's more focused on, I want to say it was the mulata. Let me just check that. Let's just go through. Anyway, old world monkeys, it's more uh, associated to, yeah, it was mulata that seems to have the biggest uh, response to it, uh, particularly in old, uh, in, in the old cohort. Okay, so we can establish, an, and if you're losing 11, 15% of your body weight in a few days in a monkey, trust me, that's crisis mode. You have to make interventions. It's the law that you make interventions. So, um let's move on from there here these are glass opacities that have been identified in the monkeys so basically uh, let me just pull that back up you can go back up right so that's the glass opacity once you take the tissue out so it's basically more dense okay because the tissue is uh, the membranes are breaking down it's become uh, fibrotic etc so let's move down uh, here you can see the uh, tissue before uh, it's been fixed with formalin these red patches again are the uh, the glass opacities as you would see them on x-ray um, they didn't in this case they didn't see much in the heart uh, uh, sw uh, swollen lymph nodes in this particular case but we've recognized it we can take this pathogen we can put it into a monkey boom that's sure that and it causes the exact same disease that we're seeing in monkeys that monkey is blinded to what's going on okay so um uh, my dad took the pfizer based on my approval is fine um my advice to you right now well i'm not going to speak about therapies that you should make your own conclusions after this presentation uh, again, this is just showing uh, that they can isolate the pathogenic agent in tissues in monkeys. And we're going to go to the gain of function dual use technology, which is coming out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is our prime suspect. This is where the WHO organization has gone to uh, investigate the pandemic. And please look at my other streams, anything that involves EcoHealth, Peter Dayzak, you'll find out what a corrupt, uh, slithering mess that it is. And no one has clean hands in this particular case. It's a very dirty tar baby of a hand grenade that's going off. Um, and I would say, yeah, listen to the Norwegian authorities right now. So, um, what we so, so my suspicions were first aroused about the Wuhan Institute in December, January, when the supposed pandemic was beginning. They weren't they weren't doing what I what I've been trained to do to work in BSL three laboratories, which is fall back till you know anything better. Um, what we found was was that um, metadata from phones shows that the release probably occurred in early October. October. This was also confirmed by Harvard uh, through satellite imaging. Again, like I say, if you want these papers, you can get the title from this. Uh, that's what the pause button is for. If you can't do that, uh, contact me. And if I'm feeling in a good mood, you'll probably get the paper from me or a direction to where to get it on our Discord. So let's go. So uh, again, another image of SARS. Uh, this is COVID-19. This is the agent. Get it into your head. These particles are real and they can be tinkered with it's a multi-billion dollar industry that has defense agencies across the world slap, slap, <laughs> licking their lips 
and the uh, the more dubious uh, organizations that uh, are um, coming into the uh, larger narrative uh, again um, they are looking very closely at what's going on and I'll just use two words the great reset or three words great the great reset or great reset uh, whichever you want free or two so um, another sort of close-up if you want to understand what we're looking at so here's the cell uh, sorry the viral surface these are phospholipids this is the spike glycoprotein this is a lot of what the fuss is about and then there's the uh, genetic material inside the uh, the virus itself uh, it's primarily considered to bind to human ace2 but we're going to see that the story is a bit more uh, complex than that is that a demon coming out of that virus it's kind of close right like a coiled dragon or snake um, <laughs> do you know it's not China's research uh, I'm not sure what that means but I, I, not, I don't want to get distracted by comments too much uh, yes China has destroyed all the evidence anyone that's thinking that we're going to get anything approximating an objective um, investigation into the Wuhan Institute the uh, the uh, anything to do with the Chinese military, anything to do with the US military uh, is sorely mistaken in this. You cannot trust these institutes, you cannot trust these people, and right now it's incumbent upon you to understand what's going on, okay, and understand the nature of the, the elements that you're dealing with. And right now it's like the Aztecs standing on the, you know, the... I don't know how how true it is, but apparently because the Aztecs had never seen ships before, they couldn't understand what it was and really didn't see them as the Spanish came and invaded <laughs> South America. And with uh, 30 horses and 30 good men and some dogs, uh, they tore the place to pieces. So... Um, we will never know patient zero. Patient zero is the poor postdoc that supposedly left who we had pictures of in 2018. There's enough people uh, looking uh, out for her. She's not really on my scope, uh, but there are other people who are interested in where she is. And that should be one of the uh, bigger questions of this investigation. So where do I come into this, not being a, viro a virologist? Well, there are certain viruses that we understand to be neurotropic, which means that they can uh, get or get themselves into your nervous system. And once in the nervous system, they can do all sorts of trouble. And this is um, this happens with viruses that are natural, supposedly Japanese encephalitis. I'll, li I'll read them off here. This is just a list from uh, Wikipedia. You can go check it yourself. Uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, California encephalitis, uh, polio, Coxsackie, echo, mumps, measles, influenza, rabies. Rabies I want you to keep in your mind because it will come up again, as well as caused by members of the family herpes viridae, such as herpes simplex, varicella zoster, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, HHV, six viruses. Those causing latent infection include herpes simplex and varicella zoster viruses. Those causing slow virus infection include measles virus, rubella, and it is called just JC virus, and retroviruses such as human T lymphosatic virus 1 and H. IV, which is something that will come up again. Uh, neurotropic viruses are increasingly being exploited as research tools, especially in the neurosciences, uh, especially agents like rabies that have this ability to travel up axons uh, in a sort of retrograde uh, transport. So it means it sort of comes into the sensory nerve endings uh, and then it climbs along the uh, axon into the cell body and then uh, other cells that are or other neurons that are synapsing onto that neuron uh, the the cell produces more rabies virions and then it jumps the synaptic gap and we use this to map extended networks in the central nervous system so uh, this is just to show you that multiple we understand SARS-CoV-2 to be a multiple uh, system inflammatory disorder it affects multiple tissues and organs uh, urinary system uh, circulatory system and brain brain is where i want to focus on um 
I'm going to skip that slide. It's a little bit out of date. And uh, there's a phylogenetic tree of uh, coronaviruses. And this is where SARS-CoV-2 sits. It's, it's an outlier with respect to the phylogenetic tree, as the experts understand it. And um, there's a lot of elements embedded into its molecular makeup that uh, are leaving virologists scratching their head when trying to constrain it within the domain of natural virology. Once you take the brakes off with something like dual-use technology, then the, the properties that we're seeing become uh, more self-explanatory. Um, Cow smart, how are you doing? Dirty Merkin, how are you doing? Uh, like I say, I'm going to be uh, trying to not take too much focus on the chat, so uh, please bear with me. I want this to be a, uh, a presentation, lecture, which people can take away, cut up, and share to your uh, friends and family, your loved ones. They need to understand what's going on, okay? Particularly, uh, mm, there's no virus, my freedoms, etc., people uh we have to these people have to understand what it is that we're dealing with um outlier because of where it originated no i don't it's an outlier because of the what we see with respect to obviously the fear and cleavage we're going to get to that everyone's very familiar so uh sars2 uh has so remember we we looked at this slide this glycoprotein here and let's go back so here it kind of sits this is uh the top of the glycoprotein and here you can see uh, this is kind of where the receptor binding domain is so here you can see the receptor binding domain and here you can see this is the junction between the S1 and S2 segments of the protein and this is one of the bigger indicators that we have gain of function this is something that's called a furin cleavage site and um, what that does is it ups the ability to make the virus more transmissible uh, thousands of times <laughs> more transmissible i'm firmly in the my freedoms camp yes so should we all be but you have to fight smart for your my freedoms not the uh don't be a fucking don't be a moron okay when you when you're engaging in this okay <laughs> there are there are people that know what they're doing okay and they know uh, and we can potentially advise and point you to things that you should be looking for in your environment okay so uh, let's move on. So this is something that we're going to be interested in, the receptor binding domain and the furin cleavage site. Okay, I've done plenty of lectures about this before. You can go see other people probably do it much better than I if they're molecular biologists. What they won't have is how to show you what goes on in the as a, at a systems neuroscience level. So here's this uh, furin cleavage site. Uh, here you can see other closely related um, uh, coronavirus is RATG13, which is its closest, probably synthetic uh, cousin, and none of them have a furin cleavage site. Nothing's come close to having a furin cleavage site. Everything that they've tried to uh, shove down our throat obviously looks, um, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a miss. But the pro the problem is is that they could synthesize a whole new virus now, and we wouldn't, uh, we'd be none the wiser basically. And that's the level of the technology we have. What we have to do is we have to look at behavior, money flow, and uh, intent as to uh, or motive as to what these people could want. Uh, title was aerosolized prions. So we now have mad cow disease as well as rabies. Yes, we're going to be getting to that cow smart. So uh, please hold on to your hats. But there's a there's a lot of steps that we have to get through to demonstrate the uh, the logic behind what it is that I'm saying. Is the HIV scare in African even real? Uh, Kahina, just uh, I'm ignoring it and try to stay on topic with your questions, please. Um, we know that uh, there are postdocs, young scientists who have um, suffered, it would appear. Uh, Li Men Yang springs to mind. Uh, this young man, oh, I've forgotten his name, it's been so long since I. Bing, Bing Lu uh, was shot uh, in a murder suicide. And like I say, there's the postdoc that's missing from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. He was working in this uh, Yvette Baha's lab at Pittsburgh and was there doing sort of informatics i think so um so let's get to sars-cov-2 neurotropism 
right, which means growing in the brain and how it attacks the nervous system and brain itself. So, so one of the first papers which came out with respect to SARS-CoV-2, which uh, sort of intimated to me that there was a problem despite the uh, disturbing images coming from China, people uh, in convulsive states, people collapsing, etc. The um, the the one the one that stuck uh, stuck out for me was how come so many people were um, deteriorating so quickly. It didn't make sense from my understanding. You know, I've dealt with pneumonia in monkeys, severe pneumonia, in fact, uh, especially with Parkinsonian monkeys where they don't move, and the um, the this paper came out the neuroinvasive potential of SARS-CoV-2 may be at least partially responsible for the respiratory failure of COVID-19 patients what does that what does that title mean it means that the agent is getting itself into the nervous system it's messing with regulatory centers in the medulla and other parts of the brain that control your autonomic nervous system and the rabies super antigenic component which I talked about here so I should just go back here and uh, focus on this just so keep people up to speed so SARS-CoV-2 protein here you can see it aligned with alpha cobra toxin alpha brungotoxin rabies virus G protein alpha cobra toxin HIV 1 GP 120 there's a lot of synonymous relationship between uh, SARS-CoV-2, furin cleavage site, and uh, these particular uh, reactive peptides uh, in uh, from that we know in biology that cause problems. And in this particular case, uh, it would appear that they have an affinity for cholinergic receptors. That's the mechanism by which uh, rabies transfects itself through the central nervous system. Uh, also how a, a lot of neurotoxins work. So uh, let's move on. So let's get to this. So uh, this is some text from that. So uh, that particular paper, this one, uh, the neuroinvasive potential of SARS-CoV-2. So according to the complaints of a survivor, the medical graduate, 24 years old from Wuhan University, so she's not an old person, remember, and just in her case, she got exposed to a, uh, a large viral uh, load because she's working uh, in a hospital. Okay. And the uh, she went on to say that she must, she had to stay awake and breathe consciously uh, while she was in the intensive care. So I want you to think about what that means. You don't think about your breathing. I'm not thinking about my breathing now whilst I'm talking to you. It's all taken care of. I'm able to do speech. That's modulated through higher order centers. And they're interacting at these midbrain uh, brainstem levels. And you're seeing this fluid and I hope uh, interesting presentation for you about what SARS-CoV-2 is. Now, once the subconscious element has gone away and because it's being dysregulated by uh, the virus getting into the medulla, she's having to consciously breathe every breath, right? So she's literally no sleep. She's got to stay there. Well, I, I guess they could have intubated her, but um, again, you know, time, uh, maybe she just, maybe she saw what happened to the intubated patients. She decided to do it this way. So <laughs> uh, she, she, if she had uh, balls, they would be big and made of brass. So let's move on from that. Again, I've spoke about this a lot before. Um, the original SARS was shown to be neurotropic. So um, they injected it into the, uh, the nasal passage of rats and this fluorescent uh, image that you can see here is the sagittal section, which means you cut me this way, right? Sorry, and you're seeing the the side of the brain, and that's showing you that basically the virus has penetrated uh, into the brain through the olfactory bulb into uh, all these um, uh, ventral regions, which are highly involved in what we would call limbic uh, processes. So let's move down a little bit. So um, what am I talking about with the virus being able to penetrate into the medulla? Well, there's areas in the med medulla, we call them the respiratory complexes or Botzinger complex. And Botzinger complex is famous for having this rhythmicity to it, which is what you're seeing uh, here. This is this is basically cl more clear here. And um, when it goes up, you'll, in you'll 
take in air you'll inspire like that neurons will fire lf like we'll see electrical signals in the in the nervous system it it goes down and you you exhale air and this is all automatic and generated through um feedback loops uh within the botzinger complex and their projection down to the muscles that are involved in your uh metabolic processes uh, or, or breathing respiration is a better way of putting it so and it's automatic but once that once the virus gets in there and messes it up well if you're if you're unconscious you need a machine to do it for you if you've got those big big brass ones you can tough it out like the uh, chinese doctor and consciously stay awake for the uh, breathing <laughs> and uh, i guess you could uh, stimulants modafinil or something maybe that's a, a way to get through it but um so th here's here's a sort of spoiler of what we're going to get into and uh th there's a trigger warning for this if you're new here um you're going to see animal experimentation in order for me to demonstrate my points uh this is experimentation done on primates so if you're squeamish uh look away and uh but i'm using it to hammer home a point to uh people and uh it's it's just the way it is right this is how uh this is how i get this um this message out so people understand okay and it it sort of establishes the uh the neural mechanisms that we can do that uh, what i'm talking about is understood at a systems neuroscience level so um very early on we got reports of uh, uh necrotizing encephalopathy in uh, a patient this is in new york as sars cov2 uh, emerged in the city and uh, encephalopathy is a hallmark of prion disorders okay now um is this a result of immediate fast onset prion disorders maybe maybe not it's maybe more down to the inflammatory response itself we don't know till we do the the proper studies and those studies need doing we need big monkey studies uh, especially with the vaccines and their mechanism of action so let's move uh, on so this is how i'm going to give you the answers that i'm going to give you today this is real-time electrophysiology this allows us to record across large-scale networks in the frontal cortex the motor associative limbic regions into the midbrain the basal ganglia and the cerebellar um uh midbrain uh, pons area of the brain and to do this all simultaneously and to uh, show causality in the pattern of neural behavior such that you can predict what type of behaviors that you'll see now i've spent a year talking about covid zombies and the acute effects of uh exposure to the the spike proteins and the active peptides uh, in that system so um we can combine that with uh, fusion MRI CT scans enables us to target uh, very precisely in the brain uh, here you can see it targeting the uh, the nucleus accumbens and through through that we can I then inject uh, excitotoxins basically into the brain much like uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an excitotoxin um, due to its uh, cholinergic uh, antagonism so uh let's go down and again we don't uh, it also there are other mechanisms which we'll get into and i want you to think of SARS-CoV-2 as something more than just a respiratory pneumonia it's bigger than that and it's highly tuned to attack your central nervous system okay so um let's move on let me just take a drink switch okay so these are studies that i've done you can go back let's go back 20 years uh these just established that we can induce different behaviors very specifically uh, apologize for the video quality but this was even but this is all analog okay we didn't have digital cameras back then and what you're looking at is induction of stereotypy ocd like behavior and uh well perhaps for this one uh we might just uh as you look at the monkey in the bottom corner here uh omni if you're in the chat could you put a link to uh the covid zombie 
that you that you put earlier that would be really really useful as i'm uh, giving this talk so the uh, we're able to go in with that sort of precision targeting that i showed you and then we're able to modulate specific circuitry within the the central nervous system to induce these gross behaviors that you see here in very predictable manner like i say it's been published for a long time it's established pathway and i helped establish the uh, i am the king of the uh, Tourette monkey model uh, no one else took it as far as i did um and uh with what I've tried to show and as a reason for the uh, what I call the COVID zombie is that SARS-CoV-2 by going through the olfactory bulb targets limbic networks and you're going to see uh, some of the behaviors. All oh, right, it doesn't do that, does it? So I need uh, turn that off. All right, so let's do this. Um, so this is what made me famous really was the uh, induction of vocal tics by uh, activation of limbic networks. So you get the idea. We'll look at human examples later in the in the talk. So uh, as well as that, what we also see are autonomic dysregulation. Okay, so disinhibition of autonomic systems. Okay, and I want you to grab this concept and, and grip it firmly with two hands. That your emotions are uh, bound intimately with visceral the the viscera of your body. That's what we talk about. You know, feelings being it feels visceral feels alive and so when you're uh, if you have this sort of um activity going on in your brain then you can have this activation of these uh, large scale networks and you can see more i might just turn the music down a little bit because everyone's seen that gag now but um yeah if you're offended look away now i would say does it cause blink as well? It causes a lot. Anything, you name it, we've probably done it. In this case, you're seeing induction of uh, erection. Um, it lasts hours. <laughs> the monkey can't do anything about it. Um, and that uh, rather attractive brown splodge in the bottom is the bowels of let go. And Brad says, nice big cock indeed. And so we can get all sorts of ticks, okay, depending on where we make these interventions. So you'll, you'll begin to understand, I hope, as I go through this, um, as I go through this talk, why you would see these particular effects and the importance of um, understanding the potential that we're dealing with an aerosolized prion. So, um, as a heuristic and rule of thumb, what you can understand all those behaviors to be is to be a case of um, loss of impulse control. And I, I know that seems a sort of banal way of describing it, but basically, <laughs> if you're drunk, uh, if you, you know, think about all those times when you've done something you just shouldn't have, right? Uh, in rage, etc. How do you induce ticks, target electrodes? Many ways, you know, many ways. Um, once you know the circuitry, you can do all kinds of things. So I would say that, you know, a lot of the, uh, the civil unrest that we're seeing right now is being fueled in part by uh, a a number of people are probably carrying a chronic infection that is sitting in the brain. It's not everything, but I would imagine it would play a part or very easily could be thought to play a part. So uh, let's get into some molecular mechanisms and the uh, the targeting that, that occurs with that the virus uses. And this will bring us to, uh, wasn't your research primarily targeted at Alzheimer's? No, well, systems neuroscience and Alzheimer's, not so much. Parkinson's, Tourette's, OCD, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, um, things of that nature. Um, I've, I've 
you know, I tried to cover as much as you can. That's what you do when you're in research. You try to you try to get your name stamped on everything. Um, so anyway, let's uh, let's move on. So one of the disturbing elements that we're finding is that SARS-CoV-2 uses co-receptor binding to uh, enable uh, its uh, ability to penetrate into tissue systems. And it didn't take long for people to show that um, SARS-CoV-2 was able to target a, a receptors called neuropilin and by its name that tells you that it's associated with uh, the nervous system both peripheral and central nervous system and so not only does SARS-CoV-2 have a highly adapted binding site ACE2 binding site for primates somehow magically it's got a binding site that's tuned for primate neuropilin okay which means that it's able to get into the central nervous system uh maybe kahina well you answer that question afterwards so um here if you're into molecular imaging etc this is this is for you uh this is co-localization uh i want to say this is the furin cleavage c and r um I'll, I'll leave that to molecular biologists and what they do for me as soon as I know that it's binding to neural tissue, again, it makes me stand back and say, we need to look at this differently than it being just a flu. Um, uh, yes, Eugene, we'll get to that. So, like I say, please share this out. Okay, you, people need to get this information out. Okay, they need to understand what they're dealing with. So another this is another study SARS-CoV-2 spike protein hijacks uh, VEGFA neuropilin one receptor signaling to induce analgesia. So this thing has adapted itself to make it that you feel less pain. Okay, so you don't feel ill. This is the asymptomatics who are carrying around infection. And uh, uh, Kahina maybe uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but the in this case this this virus has multiple mechanisms by which it can target the central nervous system peptide sequence around the furin cleavage site that rabies hiv gp120 sequence that's a cholinergic antagonist okay that's critical to understand that it can explain a lot of why people get it and if they're susceptible can progress very rapidly through the illness because the autonomic nervous system comes under attack. Uh, do, 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 do. I, I don't need to go through this uh, abstract. We're not, I just want to get home that uh, studies are being done which shown that it does target neuropilin. It reduces um, spire, uh, firing in spinal root ganglion, also probably in the central nervous system itself, and that res that leads to analgesia. Uh, we can skip that. Uh, this is just electrophysiology, which is showing, uh, again, you can go get, this is the preprint. I haven't updated the talk for that, but I'm presuming, I, I think this one has actually made it through. And uh, neuropilling one, this is another paper, uh, again, showing that it's, it uses neuropilling one. Um, and again, you've got to ask yourself, how come it has all these, uh, all these binding sites which are tuned for hominids, for humans, you, okay? Think that it goes for the CD4 and CD8 receptors on the white blood cells and potentially has long-term consequences there with respect to immunity we're seeing people now report chronic yeast infections you know who you know who else does that hiv patients um glxl says my central cns related yes i can understand dude um i can i was there as well it's very disturbing um so more about neuropilin and um again this just all this is here just to demonstrate so again if you're not believing in viruses etc we can co-localize uh the virus with specific receptors using immunohistochemistry this is standard practice and has been for decades in uh labs around the world and people have become very very good and adept at uh, manipulating these uh 
these systems okay so let's see let's go around there so um so here you can see olfactory transmuconal SARS-CoV-2 invasion as port of central nervous system entry into COVID-19 patients. Uh, this pu this was published just a couple of months ago in Nature Neuroscience. Uh, it shows that the virus is getting past the uh, the the membrane of the uh, of the sinuses and it's starting to invade into the olfactory bulb which is what i showed you at the beginning with the mouse in the in the parasagittal section where you could see the uh, the virus being highlighted in the like the ventral underside of the brain and it was all through the brain and it in that particular case the uh, the site of infection was the olfactory bulb the same seems to be happening in humans um this paper uh i just i should give a shout this this um well no it's not this paper but um what this these papers showed that they can take stem cells and they can grow proto brains so they so they they have uh essentially neural structure and they start wiring and firing together and you'll see sort of layered uh structures and ventricles forming as uh, as this proto brain forms and it's susceptible to infection by SARS-CoV-2 um do, 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 do. So, COVID-19 pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 infection, public health emergency, maybe. COVID-19 typically exhibits respiratory illness. Uh, I beg to differ. Unexpectedly emerging clinical reports indicate that neurological symptoms continue to rise, suggesting detrimental effects of SARS-CoV-2 on the central nervous system. Here we show that a Dusseldorf uh, isolate of SARS-CoV-2 enters 3D human brain organoids within two days of exposure. This is a shock for the virology community, okay, because they're like, well, what are ACE2 receptors doing on neurons, etc.? I can tell you this, if there's a neuron in the outside of the body, you'll find it in the central nervous system as well. you just got to look in the right place. And, of course, <laughs> oh, this is interesting. So, uh, using COVID-19 convalescent serum, we identified SARS-CoV-2, preferably target soma of cortical neurons, but not neural stem cells, the target cells type of Zika virus. So, it differs slightly from Zika virus, but expect Zika to be coming along pretty soon and potentially nipper with all these degenerates running uh, the institutes and taking their money and doing what they're doing right now. Um Mouth breathers are safe. No, they're not, Stephen. Sorry. <laughs> it, it can go through the lungs into the medulla. Uh, there's not much. Uh, it can go through every pathway. Um, so if you want to uh, go and look at these papers, that again, they're using immunohistochemistry. It's a beautiful technique. Here you can see different... Um, you know, the fluorescence, different wavelengths, and they can show how it's co-localized with neurons, etc. A very beautiful piece of work. Uh, do, 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 do. We can skip that. So uh, over 50% of SARS-CoV-2 patients have neurological sequelae. Okay, that means that um, they they don't just have a cough. There's this they they're coming in with well, there's a spectrum obviously from mild to severe neurological symptoms, and the list seems virtually endless. And what we're gonna hopefully come away with once we've gone through this lecture, is to understand that there could be a very long chronic component that's a consequence of this prion genesis, for want of a better word. Um, do, 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 do. So, uh, so again, these are just images of brain. It's interesting that the uh, temporal lobes, which are linked very closely to the olfactory system, so memory, you know, think how smells evoke memory, etc. And uh, in the temporal lobe, uh, you have the amygdala as well. That's sitting very close. It's part of the extended basal ganglia. Amygdala is involved in fear processing, uh, getting you amped up, and um uh you, you've got to be um you've got to be aware of this pattern that we keep seeing and this limbic targeting seems critical to a lot of what we're uh, seeing especially in the short term the long term is probably going to look a different little different uh so you like I say these are just links i'll leave it the, you can pause on this screen you can get the the citation here uh you can all of you can type now hopefully um and um, I've done plenty of presentations about this, but 
Again, these are just uh, MRIs. Again, here you can see in the temporal lobe. Let me just go back up uh, again. Um, lesions in the temporal lobe, and here, and probably striatum. Temporal lobe here. Temporal lobe here. Um, it's it's a very consistent pattern here. You can see in the temporal lobe, um, and these are in young patients. Okay, so. Um, this is something to keep in mind. This isn't these. Are, you're not looking at aged brains here. These are brains of the young. Um, I mean that's a catastrophic uh, failure. They're showing up. Um, and what I want to get into now uh, is is we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, the prion genesis what's what's happening the paper that i missed and uh unfortunately uh for you guys um this i don't know if i saw it at the time and it didn't register but um the title of this paper is sars sit up in your chairs right now pay attention sars cov2 prion like domains in spike proteins enable higher affinity to ACE2. Now, you know what? I had a little. Um, let me just find it. I uh, I want to thank uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft for um, forcing an update on me, even when I have updates switched off, and uh, I I'm delayed somewhat by the, uh, the the what I wanted to speak about. So I I just had something uh, that I did want to show that we can. Uh, I hope clarify what a prion is and how I, how it relates to um, prion-like domains. So just bear with me uh, one second. Let's go here. Let's go here. Let's put this here. It doesn't have sound, as far as I can tell. So nanobot models. Uh, Prion disease, mechanisms of Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease, CJD types, 85% of all cases are sporadic form, 14% caused by family genetic mutation, uh, main symptoms, social withdrawal, insomnia, dementia, muscle paralysis, coma. Hmm, I could tick a few of them off right now. <laughs> um, all these are caused by protein particles. They are called prions, right? So they don't even require genetic material. It just needs the misfolded protein to start causing the disease okay and these these peptide sequences are infectious and can begin replicating this is this is you know there's a lot of work in, in, in systems neuroscience about why do we get alzheimer's disease why do we get parkinson's and what we there's a lot of work that's focused on the uh presentation with lewy bodies which are um entanglements of the cytoskeletal matrix and uh as you sort of get um uh, uh, older you accumulate more of this this sort of protein garbage in your in your central nervous system you don't clear it it builds up and depending on which system is activated will depend on how you present to the clinician uh, as you begin to check out um so it says your work's great. Thank you, Jimmy. So let's just uh, carry on. Uh, humans can contract Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease by consuming material from animals infected with scrapey prion form. So this is classic prion disease, okay? The the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow, uh, Curie disease, uh, which was discovered from cannibals in Papua New Guinea. Um, excuse me. So in goes the protein, right? So you can ingest it, okay? Or you could breathe it in. You could breathe it in, okay? Um, and it can be part of that receptor, right? So when I'm talking about a receptor binding domain, there's protein foldings in it that, that act like prions, okay? So remember, we've established that SARS-CoV-2 can invade the central nervous system, Okay. If I haven't convinced you enough of that by yet, and I haven't convinced you that I know what I'm talking about, I don't know what else I can do. Okay. Um, 
I have only seen this once, I'm going to forget it. Uh, you've seen it in the clinic, yeah, it's uh, pretty grim. Good to see you, Richard, by the way. Uh, PR, oh, sorry, so, let me pause that. PR, pro protein, uh, sorry. Prion protein, prions are produced by an endoplasmic reticulum inside a cell. They move towards the membrane surface in the transport vesicles. Exosomes. Uh, so here it says prion normal form. So in in this, I'm guessing they they're, they're meaning uh, normal protein signaling fragments. We know that cells shoot out uh, protein signaling molecules, etc. And what you, the the key to understanding this is a protein has a particular three D shape. Okay called its conformation and that conformation is constantly sort of jiggling as it's sort of trying to come to terms with its binding energies etc and uh, what's going to happen is the normal prion um, is going to come into contact or the protein particle is going to come into contact with the misfolded uh, prion okay here comes the misfolded one it looks a bit like the thing again out it goes uh, in the signaling vesicle and uh, it's transformed the normal one and that normal one now becomes infective as well okay and then it goes on and on and spreads so here you're getting uh that's nice um so uh prion transformation is based on changing strands geometry which is what i'm saying so the abnormal one comes in it's in one particular shape it bumps up against it probably when it's in an open configuration of some form the uh, the the abnormal prion confers this abnormal shape onto it and like i say it goes on it changes the uh, the conformation of the um the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets so it becomes another infective particle out it goes so this is the lipid bilayer of the neuron in this particular case prion moves to the cell membrane surface transform and aggregate into complex amyloid strands so uh, beta amyloid is the, like I say, the bugbear of uh, the neurosciences and the clinical field. The, you know, how much is causal, et cetera, is still under debate. Um, but we, we know it's there and associated. So let's move on. So there, there it's forming its tangle. And where the beta amyloid starts to aggregate will depend on the type of neurodegeneration that you get. So if you get sort of Creutzfeldt-Jakob type encephalopathy, or you get something more chronic like Parkinson's disease or multi-system atrophy. Now, what does McCann say about survivors having T cell immunity to SARS-2? Um, well, uh, what we're seeing is is that the uh, there seems to be a chronic component. We know that SARS attacks CD4 uh, and CD8, so it attacks the immune system. Right now, a year later, we're starting to hear about people reporting uh, COVID um, yeast infections, uh, particularly in the mouth and that's synonymous with what happens in HIV and the uh, the assault on white blood cells has been well documented now SARS-CoV-2 so again but it doesn't mean everyone's going to succumb right this is what you have to understand it just means that there's there's a spectrum of responses and some are going to be acutely sensitive and some probably it's not going to make any difference Okay, it's the genetic uh, lottery that you that you pick normally. But what we do find is that there seems to be a um, racial component to the virus. 
the particularly in western nations where dark-skinned uh, dark races are seem to be somewhat more susceptible that might be down to vitamin d who knows um so let's move on so yeah here it's forming its amyloid plaque play and amyloid plaques are associated with alzheimer's parkinson's disease Kreutzfeldt Jakob and any number of neurodegenerative disorders. Okay, uh, often you see it in something. If it's the classic chronic neurodegenerative disorders, I encourage you to look uh, for something called BRAC staging. B R double A K. I want to say BRAC and BRAC. Yeah. Do, 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 do. So look at the flu season four years ago to two years ago then today uh i've done all that jimmy stella this is not flu i've busted uh Ivor cummins uh stats with respect to flu etc he's talking out of his ass and the fact that we're dealing with a lab based lab based agent means that you should uh take everything he says with a pinch of salt he's n he's nothing but a grifting diet book salesman okay and he doesn't know what he's talking about uh, so let's move on. Uh, so, oops, can I get out of full screen, please? Okay. So, um, like I say, this is a year old, and I am mortified. I miss this because we should have been hammering this. Uh, how do you know it's lab? By the uh, the properties that it has, it has everything of gain of function. Like I say, go and watch the many lectures that I've done. There are a number of papers now which point to the lab based origin, and the fact that we know that there's a um, very, very large network of scientists who are complicit in trying to hide the nature of the disorder. So if you look into the uh, in, uh, organization called EcoHealth, a person called Peter Dazak, how they uh, corralled the narrative uh, in a letter in The Lancet saying that um, it couldn't, it has to be uh, coming from nature, they chose a pangolin. Uh, this is the intermediate host theory. Uh, it's all broken down, nothing holds up, and more and more evidence points to it being an engineered, uh, an engineered agent. And this just adds another salami slice to to the evidence. So uh, currently, the world is struggling with the coronavirus. Again, every paper begins. You can be begin usually a sentence or two in. So uh, prion-like domains are critical for virulence and the development of therapeutic targets. However, the prion-like domains in the SARS-CoV-2 proteome have not been analyzed. In this in silico study using the P-LUC algorithm, we identified the presence of prion-like domains in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Compared with other viruses, a striking difference was observed in the distribution of prion-like domains in the spike protein. Let me read that again. Compared with other viruses, a striking difference was observed in the distribution of prion-like domains in the spike protein. Okay, so this, the spike protein is where we're interested in a lot of the engineering going or, or, or the potential manipulations that have occurred. And suddenly we're dealing with uh, an agent that has this uh, prion binding surface in it that's going to form these that has the potential to form amyloid plaques okay and remember what i said to you it's the it's the nature of the distribution of the amyloid plaques which will determine the neurodegenerative disorder which takes you out what takes most people out when they get into old age it's either stroke alzheimer's parkinson's okay so multi-system atrophy and so uh, let's go on with this. Uh, compared with other viruses, a striking difference. Oh, I did that bit. Uh, the presence and unique distribution of prion-like domains in the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domains of the spike protein is particularly interesting. Since although the SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-S proteins share the same host cell receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, SARS-CoV-2 demonstrates a 10 to 20 fold higher affinity for ACE2. Finally, we identified prion-like domains in the alpha-1 helix of the ACE2 receptor that interact with the viral receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. Taken together, the present findings indicate that the identified prion domain, is that what the PRDS was, that, what's the exact acronym? I want to make sure I'm getting it. PRDS. 
PRDS. Prion domain site, binding site, I guess that is prion domain site, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain and ACE2 region that interact with the RBD have important functional roles in viral adhesion and entry and the consequences of chronic infection. So uh, this published by George and Victor Tetz from uh, uh, it was microbiology. Oh, I should have. Um, do I have paper to hand? Um, maybe it's in the next slide. Uh, no, it's. <laughs> let me just uh, uh, make sure that I'm quoting that right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. And back. Uh, yeah, here's the institute, Human Microbiology Institute. It's an old institute, um, but it seems small, and um, I, I don't know the providence of it. But what I wanted to uh, point to is that uh, the this pair, George Tetz and Victor Tetz, have a paper in Scientific Reports from 2018 about the same thing, uh, prion-like domains in eukaryotic viruses, where they scanned the whole databases that we have to look for the, uh, the presence of these prion binding sites as they relate to all viruses. Okay, so uh, this is pretty high impact journal again i know the impact factor etc is coming under uh, ever more scrutiny because of the well the dealings of the of these people that have abused the system so prions are proteins that can self-propagate which is the video that i just showed you leading to the misfolding of proteins in addition to the previously demonstrated pathogenic roles of prions during the development of different mammalian diseases including neurodegenerative diseases they have recently been shown to represent an important functional component in many prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms and bacteriophages confirming the previously unexplored important regulatory and functional roles. However, in an in-depth analysis of these domains in, eukary in eukaryotic viruses has not been performed. Here we examine the presence of prion-like proteins in eukaryotic viruses that play a primary role in different ecosystems and that are associated with emerging diseases in humans. We identified relevant functional associations in different viral processes and regularities in the presence at different taxonomic levels using the prion-like amino acid composition computational algorithm. We detected 2,679 unique putative prion-like domains within 2,742,160 publicly available viral protein sequences. So to find a prion binding domain in a virus is rare, okay, 0.00001%, okay, very, very small. More than that. So, to the minus six, five, sorry. So, um, do, 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 where was it? Our findings indicate that viral prion like proteins can be found in different viruses of insects, plants, mammals, and humans. The analysis performed here demonstrated common patterns in the distribution of prion like domains across viral orders and families and reveal probable functional associations within different steps of viral replication and interaction with host cells. These data allow the identification of the viral prion like proteins as potential novel regulators of viral infection. Infections. I mean, that's a very sort of <laughs> uh, detached way of saying that these viruses, which can go around, and remember, it's a small family, okay, or a small, small sampling that have this prion capacity baked into their structure. So this may be designed to take people out prematurely by creating this kind of condition in our young. Yes, and to take out the old as well. Um, everyone uh, is going to be uh, exposed to this, and like I said, it's you know it's the genetic lottery how you get through. But um, we have to look at the fact that there's all these elements that are embedded in SARS-CoV-2. How did it have all these elements just suddenly emerge? Where 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 was the progenitor viruses? Where did we see these sort of outbreaks occur? And we know that the 
the infection probably of the pandemic started September October time. SARS-CoV-2 neurotropism prion genesis, uh, and here you can see the types of viruses where they found these prion binding domains. We're interested in RNA viruses, so they found 601 viruses that had these prion binding domains. I don't know how many RNA viruses there are for humans. Uh, I imagine it's a hell of a lot more than 601. Um, let's go down. Uh, so, um, as I've read through the papers, we're interested in Nido virilis, okay, and uh, log likelihood of association in different viral groups, and coronavirus is part of this uh, genus, I guess, Nido viralis, well, ask a virologist, not me, I'm here to tell you what happens to the nervous system. Um, and what we can see in this cross-correlation matrix is that Corona viridae down here, the Nido viralis of uh, mono non -givar non <laughs> mono non viralis, viralis, mono nega viralis, mono nega viralis. I think that's how you would stand that, or mono nega viralis. I like the last one. So um, here you can see Corona viridae, and you can see that there yeah, you're beginning to see some activation in uh, so the prion on, on the expressed protein so proteins involved in absorption and entry we're seeing some signal biosynthesis it's a bit of a vague term uh, I don't know and uh, this score here again you'd have to look at their algorithms and I'm presuming that they got it past peer review once that someone in the virology world knows and understood what was going on and uh, this hot signal here gives you the log likelihood and corona viridae have this ability have this prion domain to them okay uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, if you if you just think this is all this all just happened by chance okay i've got a bridge to sell you okay uh, so uh, there was a paper very early on that people got all in a fluster about because someone came out, someone had the brass ones to come out and say, this looks like it's lab engineered. Uh, the evidence which suggests that this is no naturally evolved virus, a reconstructed historical etiology of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. Burger Sorensen, Angus Dalgleish, Andres Susserud. To discover how to attack the SARS-CoV-2 safely and effectively, our vaccine candidate BioVac-19 was designed by first carefully analysing the biochemistry of the spike. We ascertained that it is highly unusual in several respects. Unlike any other coronavirus in its clade, the SARS-CoV-2 general mode of action is as a co-receptor dependent phagocyte. So remember those neuropilin receptors, remember those nicotinic cholinergic receptors, okay? Uh, in short, SARS-CoV-2, remember the, the CD4, uh, CD8, GP120, uh, all those uh, <laughs> all those areas are, are, are suspect now. So it's it has multiple targets that it can go through. Uh, and depending on which target it gets you at will depend on how you express it. Um, in this paper, we argue that the likelihood of this being the result of natural processes is very small. The spike has six inserts, which are unique fingerprints with five salient features indicative of purposive manipulation. We then add to the biochemistry a diachronic dimension, diachronic... Uh, I think that means sort of evolution across time by analyzing a sequence of four linked published research projects, which we suggest show by deduction how, where, when, and by uh, whom the SARS-CoV-2 spike acquired its special characteristics. This reconstructed historical etiology meets the criteria of means, timing, agent, and place to produce sufficient confidence to reverse the burden of proof. Henceforth, those who would maintain that COVID-19 pandemic arose from zoonotic transfer need to explain precisely why this more parsimonious account is wrong before asserting that their evidence is persuasive, most especially when, as we also show, there are puzzling errors in their use of evidence. 
Uh, Eugene McFarlane, thank you very much for posting it there. Um, and again, I encourage everyone, you can cut this up, you can uh, do with it as you will. Um, I know it's a long talk and I'll take questions at the end. Um, but uh, let's keep moving. So let's get back into a bit of uh, systems neuroscience. Okay, so uh, remember this is looking at the brain sideways, in this case looking that direction. Uh, this is the optic track. And the yellow areas are sensory motor areas, the green is executive function, and the blue is limbic, and it sort of keeps that structure or, or, or that, um, how would you say, the, the anatomical segregation along the midline as well. So this is now we've cut through the middle of the brain, if you like, and uh, we're interested in th these structures. Uh, this is the basal ganglia, striatum, globus pallidus, external segment, internal segment, thalamus, and basically you have cortico striatal pallidothalamic loops. Okay, that's supposed to be uh, shown here. Uh, if you have, if you want to get into these box and arrow diagrams, etc., uh, I'm happy to do that, but save it for the end. Trust me, this is established science. This is how we do the targeting and we can induce all these different symptoms. Okay, so um, what you can see here is you can see the, let's just turn this up. So you can see the spectrum. This is just looking at motor behavior. So on one end, you've got the, uh, the impulse control disorders. So in this case, you're looking at a Tourette's patient. Uh, she's got she's got vocal tics. You can see the motor tics. Um, I don't know what neuropsychiatric disorders she has. Here you can see someone with smooth, fluid movement. That all those networks are in control of engaging in something like that. And here you can see uh, senescence. This is uh, Parkinson's disease, and um, very very. A severe case of it this lady doesn't have long left I'm afraid um, but it's these particular disorders these hypokinetic Parkinson's disease uh, M multi-system atrophy Lewy body disease uh, that we're interested in because it's these that are potentially <laughs> driven by the prion binding domain in SARS-CoV-2 okay so I showed you these loops, etc. You can break down the anatomy, add infinitum, etc. But what we're interested in uh, very often is the um, the output of this pallidal segment, if you like, uh, how it influences the thalamus and how it excites the thalamic network. And this output, depending on the pattern that we get, will depend on whether we see normal Parkinsonian or Tourettism. It's the same system, it's just depending on the patterns of activity that we have within that extended network. Okay, if that doesn't make sense right now, ask me at the end, I will go through it again for you. Okay, so what I want to show you is us being able to model the hyperkinetic state, in this case, the uh, the arm tick, uh, uh, sorry, the motor tick that you saw in the girl where she was sort of jerking her head. Uh, in in that case, we can we can do it in the face and head, but the arm is more clear in this particular instance. I've got facial ticks published on the net if you want to go dig them up. And you're looking at the normal monkey. The monkey is just pressing buttons very easily. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a involuntary movement. There you go. So the arm, as you, that's another one. He, so he's, he wants to press the button, and then there's a tick, right? So, and what we're able to do in this instance is we're able to record uh, in real time how these extended neural networks are encoding this behavior. So I want to pause this one just right now. Uh, Let's just pause this. Uh, no, we'll get it. We have to play it. It's on auto. So this is a monkey, the only one of its kind that I know of, that has a Lewy body disorder. No one knows how she got it, and it's the first primate system where we've been able to see these Parkinsonian systems. Usually, we have to uh, induce it via neurotoxin, and you're gonna you're gonna look at the neurotoxin. Uh, component as well so there's another so what i want people to uh hold in their mind is that there are these acute 
phases which i talk about as the covid zombie what i'm expecting as this uh, as the chronic effects draw out is that you're going to see more effects like this okay where we think that this was a a case of sort of multi-system atrophy in the, in the non-human primate it was dopamine insensitive and um had uh very parkinsonian like traits uh, the neural activity was uh radically different to uh normal or the uh, the tick the uh, impulse control disorder um da, 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 da. Uh, so this is us inducing so where i showed you let's go back get my arrow back let's just that. so uh let's play this so let's just go to here so i want you to keep your eye on this like the tremor the stoop posture think of the old lady that you saw shuffling along okay you see the tremor in the hands And if it if it means saving one person, if you like it or lump it, I'd I'd go through these. Look, man, I love these. They're like pets to me. Every one of them. Okay. Um. Uh, but I would just keep. If I thought there was an answer in the monkey, I would keep going through them nonstop. That's what I've done, and it's directly helped children in surgery departments, and it's helped us understand neurodegenerative disorders such that I can demonstrate to you what a spontaneous prion like disorder can look like. Okay. So if you start seeing these types of symptoms in younger people in you know, that have had a run in with SARS, okay, had the neurological symptoms. And then we start seeing now, I would expect a year on that we would see this type of uh, effect and it would be more pronounced in the elderly um, all right so uh this is us artificially inducing parkinson's so all you get is a oh, no sorry excuse me so it's a very different type of uh pathology so the animal is very very bradykinetic it can't really stand up you can see it has muscle stiffness you can see the limb gets fixed Okay, and these are um, you would never have a cage door open with a monkey. Okay, this is in my lab, um, but he can barely move. He's got something that looks like dystonic, uh, almost sort of like a torticollis like symptom. Uh, and this is a classic MPTP Parkins uh, Parkinsonian monkey. And that you can go from normal to that within a few days. Um, so I hope you can see the difference between this and the other mo uh, and the monkey that I'm telling you somehow uh, the only one in the world that we know of had this spontaneous Parkinson's that looked very much like that old woman that you saw shuffling along. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna ex so these are symptoms to look for. Now I'm gonna try and explain to you the neurophysiology. So. This what this shows us is this is the tick state, okay, and we can look at these are just local field potentials, so just aggregates of electrical activity in every one of those nuclei, which I said form the cortex, basal ganglia, and also the cerebellar networks. And what you can see is you can see it propagating through the network to cause the muscle contraction. Okay, so this is one of the first times that we've literally been able to study the causality at this sub millisecond level uh, into the expression of behavior. Also, the uh, the more visceral behaviors, which I would say argue for the impulse control disorders. Um. Apologies. This is single unit firing. Uh, if you're into, if you're an electrophysiology nerd like me, this is uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, this is scientific pornography. Um, and this took me years to get this snapshot of the brain in this state to produce 
this type of uh, activity and to demonstrate causality between the, this is a very important point for those that are interested in thalamocortical uh, systems corticobasal ganglia systems that we could uh, reduce activity in the gpi and then we could get this very clear activity in cortex and the driving of the muscle okay uh, i'm very proud of this figure um this is cerebellum it's not important right now this just shows that we can get the latencies of each one of the regions i've published this uh this is journal of neuroscience 2013 uh knock yourself out it's on my research gate page uh, no. okay. right so this is just uh real time firing it's slowed down 10 times and this is just aggregate neural activity along that network and in the corner is the muscle tick okay so this is how good we are at picturing causality through the brain and networks it's not been seen before in this sort of precision but it hadn't been seen before so as protonic storm says that covid tongue now being reported oral candidesis which is a sign of immune deficiency i'd imagine also athlete's foot is probably going to be coming up um uh jock itch etc etc um Jimmy Stella says, I will study everyone you have said. I will look into every document you've put up. I will read everything and I will Excellent use Excellent knowledge, Kevin. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure who that was, but let me just see who I can say thank you to. Um, I'll, I'll say the thank you afterwards, but whoever that was, um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, let's run along. So... Um, this is me just sort of uh, embellishing and gilding lilies just showing that we can do the same we can get all the firing activity in in these different states and i showed you this slide here it is with pet imaging this is uh radio labeled water uh very difficult experiments to do but we did it i don't think they'll ever be done again to tell the truth so um treasure this knowledge i would say um this is incidental we don't need this uh, it's just about causality and spikes etc uh, if you want to talk about it. if you've got Tourette's or dealing with Tourette's um, get in touch with me I'll see what I can do uh, I've been helping some people uh, in the background and uh, the advice seems to be working somewhat so um, so let's skip this and we can skip this it's not important so what i want to say is what can we say about these hypokinetic conditions so we can now compare corticobasal ganglia cerebellar activity and parkinsonism with hyperkinetic activity so we can address the causal network properties of these disease states the 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 old lady that you see people like uh I forgot his name now back to the future michael j fox uh all these people so there is such a thing as early onset parkinson's let's see if that starts ramping up relative to the last 10 years okay uh it's excited seeing you stream then seeing you pick fights with nobody yeah um it's it's the job uh kahina uh who am i to uh who am i to uh well, uh, what would I say? You've got to, if 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 it's misinformation, you've got to tackle it. And yeah, they might seem like nobodies, but they're having an impact on people. And so it's my job to uh, protect those people as best as I can. Um, so here we can compare to, so this is the uh, shaky, tremulous, uh, spontaneous Parkinson monkey. We're able to compare um, her activity to... Uh, the acute onset Parkinson's, so we can do behavioral uh, ethno ethnograms, and we can do um, we we can study her through the day with activity monitors, and this is control. We know she's irresponsive to L-dopa, which makes us think that it's more a multi-system atrophy than a classic Parkinsonian uh, set of. Uh, symptoms so if you go to the doctor and you say oh i'm feeling really stiff in the morning i'm i'm a bit shaky etc the doctor will say to you here's some l-dopa 
take it for a week, come back and see me in a week and tell me if it helped you. If it didn't help you, they're going to say you're probably a multi-system atrophy patient. You're going to go down this treatment pathway. From that diagnosis, you've probably got two to five years left to live. If it's Parkinson's, you might get out another 10, 15 years. Okay. And it's getting better all the time. So uh, again, this is just showing electrodes in the brain, showing how we can record uh, all this activity and we can uh cross correlate the behavior with the uh the brain activity uh in real time and in this particular instance so this is a crucial slide uh what we saw in this monkey so this is uh, i want to say it's t2 weighted but you can see the basal ganglia are very dark okay uh, all the basal ganglia including the uh deep cerebellar nuclei and um, why is that? Well, it's a hypo intensity because there's iron aggregation and where there's iron aggregation, what we see is that correlates with the emergence of uh, these fibrillary tangles in the, uh, the what we call the Lewy bodies, okay, or the amyloid plaques. So iron dysregulation can be a big signal in the aged or diseased brain. So we can expect to see these sort of disorders and, you know, there's iron metabolism disorders already being associated with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, a guy in my street was taken away in a bubble suit last night after his partner died in his house. Um, so th this, what I want to establish with this is that I can tell you what this looks like at a neurological level rather than people focusing on, uh, you know, these digital, uh, sorry, these CGI um, molecules that they're twisting in 3D space and saying, oh, look at this binding site, etc. This is actual real clinical pathophysiology of these systems. And here we have what I think is you're going to see. I think I've been pretty spot on with respect to the impulse control disorders. And this is what I'm going to expect to see as uh, the uh, disease progresses. Again, if you're really interested in these stats, this is just comparing the different uh, hyperkinetic states. Uh, it's all been done. Uh, it's ready for publication. Just haven't done it. Been lazy. And um, this is all about oscillation in different networks and how the oscillations are different again if you're interested in this stuff I can describe it to you in detail if you're coming to this fresh uh, it's probably going to seem a bit like gobbledygook um, and yeah with that I'm um, at the end basically and um, I'll just let the monkey play out and then I'm gonna if you've got a question for me now's the time um, what I would do is uh hope uh just see I'll do this time uh excuse me uh i'll do this uh ask that you follow me and if you can uh help donate it's your donations that keep me going this far it's charity that enabled me to do all that research the Tourette syndrome of association Tourette syndrome association of america was integral in 20 years of research to paint this picture for you and um yeah i mean that's that's where we're at and this is what i expect to see so um Ask about Swedenborg companies in the deep state. It's a long history. Um, I'd rather avoid the deep state stuff, great, great reset stuff today. Uh, if we can keep it to the neuroscience and the biomedical stuff, that would be better. That way I can sort of cut this short. Um, I'm not sure. I can cut this into one, uh, one <laughs> stream. <laughs> it's, it's a functional stream by itself. So... I have to write syndrome, but I'm thinking right now. Let me just, I'm going to scroll back, see if I see any questions. Prions are misfolded proteins. Yes, they are. And what's, so what's the conclusion here? The spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 has a prion-like element to it. It causes stronger binding to ACE2 receptor. We don't know if that's there in the neuropillin. We don't know if it's there in the other receptors. We don't know. Right. This is all sort of cutting edge science and we have to say when we don't know.
but we know the consequences of these prion-like disorders. Viral infection has long been suspected in Alzheimer's, in Parkinson's, in multisystem atrophy. Here's, here's the monkey evidence of the... Um, of it playing out, if I can point to, um, and you know, these are, the, we've come a long way. Okay, we've come a long way to be able to describe to the, you, the public, what's going on here. And you know, I'm my prediction is that if we've got a, a prion-inducing site in this glycoprotein that's suddenly getting these mutations which is making it more it's it's increasing viral load 30 to 40 percent we know the spike glyco uh, the the glycoprotein by itself the the spike binding protein uh, the spike s1 s2 component passes the blood brain barrier once it's in the blood brain barrier we know it binds to neurons and all other uh, cells in the central nervous system it can cause a lot of havoc and mayhem. And this is what you need to understand. For the elderly, it's a big issue, okay? Because the, the nervous system is beginning to degrade anyway. Uh, just scroll down. Um, such a small particle can destroy not only life, but the peace and quality of life for people, yes. And the thing to understand is these look like inserts. Go read the Norwegian paper, okay? There's a there's scientists trying to get this out. The people that are telling you uh, that 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 this is um, a zoonotic spillover and they need a billion dollars more to protect you, etc., are lying to you. <sighs> to to take my cat trade, they're grifting you, okay? <laughs> Jimmy Stella says I bought tons of pool control products now I'm in a lot of debt the shipments and all the products he's been punting has left me with jaundice <laughs> that's funny um, uh, also COVID is clearly a nearly active virus since it attacks US states with the highest pension liabilities uh, maybe um, it, uh, yeah so I don't see um questions as such right now so i'm i'm gonna call it quits again i would say uh if you found this important if you think it can help you um i'm very much appreciative of the support and uh let's let's try and keep this going let's keep monitoring what's going on and like i say platonic storm is finding those publications as predicted where the uh, yeast infections are beginning to take hold look at how people are taken out in hospitals with yeast infections especially uh in uh, icu departments okay that's that's one of the classic ways that they go they can't control the yeast overgrowth in the patients is basically because it's so difficult to keep them clean uh, i have an unrelated question do you know anything about neurology and fear um somewhat i mean um i would say it's a question for another day kahina um and uh yeah i think with that i'm going to cut it short here Please spread this about, get word out. Don't listen to people like Ivor Cummings. Don't listen to these great Barrington people. There is a way to get through this. It requires a wartime posture. It is an act of war that's been done against us, but who's the actual party is really who we have to get out. We've got a good idea. We know who's at fault on our side. Okay, all of them need uh, bringing to account. Okay. There's no excuses to be made here. Okay. And like I say, everything about this agent just uh, just looks too convenient. Okay. Um, and I think, sure, you have named obvious Griffs and its participants, but uh, take a look in the mirror projection and donate to your Patreon, right? Yes, the song man, but I'm working here. Okay. And uh, I work all day to bring you this information. The song man. Would you be a fan of Ivor Cummings by any chance? And um, like I say, if you if you want to believe that this is just the flu, okay, and this hasn't come out of a laboratory, that it doesn't have, okay, it doesn't have prion binding sites in it, prion genesis. If you want to believe that and you don't want to believe the science, that's up to you, okay? 
Now, usually when I was doing all this research, I used to get paid to do that. Not very much. Okay. But it was enough to subsist and do this research. So now I'm again, I'm working. Okay. I'm on the clock here and it, I spend virtually every hour of the day ignoring my children a lot of the time just to keep on top of the information to bring you something that's approximating a uh, coherent narrative that you need to be taking to those that want to sell you diet books, sell you the idea that uh, viruses aren't real, tell you that masks don't do anything. Okay. So if that's how you want to put it, I'm not going to sell you stuff, okay? It's it's entirely up to you what you pay. I give the information out for free. If you think it's useful, okay, then I'm appreciating if you appreciate the work, okay? That's it. And I'm not selling you a diet book like Fat Cummings, okay? So, um, yeah, with that, I'm going to say, uh, oh, yes, the final thing, uh, most crucial of all, okay? What they're getting you to do with these vaccines is synthesize these active peptides. I want you to think about that in light of what it is that I've just talked about. And understand that these active peptides pass through the blood-brain barrier. One prion is enough. One prion is enough. So with that, I will just say, Burgle, you've missed it, sir. Uh, please wind back. And um, yeah, Tom, it's a tip jar. It's nothing else. Uh, there's no books here. There's nothing here. There's just the grim, not grim, the base reality. And um, you can like it or leave, I guess. And if you want to be, um, what is an active peptide? It's a string of amino acids that's biologically active. Cobra venom. Right, is his biologically active active peptide sequence. Okay. Rabies neurotoxin is a bio, biologically active peptide sequence. They're synonymous. Okay. SARS CoV two has it embedded in it. As well as this prion genesis site. Uh and so with that. I am going to say adieu. Thank you very much. Take care. God bless. And I've just finished with this. It doesn't mean it's all over. Okay. Um, there will be many, many that get through. It's the genetic lottery. Okay. I seem to have chronic effects from my running with it. But you know what? I'm okay so far. And um, we'll see. Um, you know, the body's an amazing thing still. Okay. It's not nightmare. It's about understanding what it is that you're dealing with. And the primary thing that you need to understand is uh, when the British government turns around and says to you, uh, it's not lab based, they're lying to you. Why are they lying to you? Because they don't want you panicking. They're happy that they that you think that there's no virus. They're happy that you think it's nothing. Right. Because all, all the bodies that they can bulldoze into a ditch, that's easy. They're done with. Once we've got a large cohort of people that are that are suffering long term consequences and going into early Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, etc., that's a big burden. And this dual use technology has got out of hand. And I don't know about you, but where I come from, if someone did that to me and my family or my people, uh, we go on the hunt and uh, we'll make sure someone pays. Especially grease balls like Dayzak, EcoHealth, Lipkin, Rasmussen, Anderson, Rambo, all of them. The list goes on and on and on. There's a big long list of people that have been lying to you, actively lying to you. We know it through Freedom of Information Acts. Yet somehow, somehow... Cummings, a thick Irish paddy who sells you diet books and doesn't understand statistics, has hundreds of thousands of views. This gets hundreds of views. Why? It's a tough message to take. Again, adieu. God bless. Take care.